Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. We hear about churches breaking apart. People disagree, and so they split. They can't seem to have honest conversations about differences. Our guests today are two authors who have entered into the conversation about how to disagree on important things that matter to Christians. Join us on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guests today are Kevin DeYoung, a pastor from Lansing, Michigan, and Ted Cluck, a writer also from Lansing. And together they have written a book, Why We're Not Emergent, by two guys who should be. Welcome. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having us. us. Great to be here. You know, this is a very current topic because in today's world, we are tolerant of things. We don't like to make uh, real hard judgments about mm-hmm. what church is in or what church is out. And yet, you know, aren't we just happy people are thinking about God? Mm-hmm. Right, right. Right? So you've decided, though, to write a book that draws some fine lines around some theology questions, around some practices for churches. Why did you want to write the book? You know, I I came to our church in uh, East Lansing, Michigan. We're right across the street from Michigan State University. So, I mean, we're we're in this world where there's lots of young people. People are questioning things. And when I came about four years ago, there was a lot of the Brian McLaren books being passed around. There's a lot of discussion about this, these kind of books getting dog-eared. And so I, I jumped in right away and had to sort of get acclimated to what this stuff was all about. And was it just a new way of doing things, or was it really more serious than that. So the more I read, the more I became troubled with the things that I was reading. And then Ted, he can tell you some of his story, but he he was kind of part of that group that was maybe thinking about going emergent. Yeah, you know, like like Kevin said, I think my perspective was that of the guy in the pew. And, you know, I think people assumed my wife and I were a lot cooler than we actually were. But you know, We got we a were, cool look. Well, yeah. thank you. It's you're, cool. He often wears kind of a kind. beret sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and we drove a used Volvo at the time, which oh. apparently you have to buy all new CDs when you could have used Volvo. But at any rate, we got all these these books and, you know, people were underlining and dog earing and, you know, a few themes began to jump out to me. Uh, it, it seemed very heavily marketed. It seemed very savvily marketed. There seemed to be a real kind of left-leaning political bent to a lot of this emergent literature, but, but very little gospel. And again, as a, a guy with no real theological training besides what I've gotten at URC, which has been great, I mean, I, I really became concerned, I I think, with how popular it was among young people and how it seemed to be kind of pulling people away from church and not really leading them to what I thought was a good place. So So when you say not a lot of gospel, Mm -hmm. just dwell on that a little bit. What are you looking for? What do you think is a hallmark of something that's good? And how how does the emergent church get away from that a little bit? Yeah, I'll jump in and see if Ted wants to add anything to it. I mean, that, that really, to me, is the biggest concern in a lot of these books that I read because a lot of the story will often go like this in the emergent books. God created the world and it was good and then we sinned. Okay, so far so good. And God made us to be priests and we're supposed to mediate his presence and we screwed up and so he sent Jesus to teach us and to show us the best way to live and now he's calling us to be agents of his shalom and bring this new creation in the kingdom to the world and let's go out and make the world a better place and live for Jesus. Now there's a lot that's right in that message but it, it's missing the cross. I mean, the cross, not just as a message of see how much God loves you, but as a substitution for our sins because we are offensive in our own nature to God. And so I'm always telling my congregation that the gospel is not, first of all, a message about what we need to do for God, but a message about what God has done for us. And what I felt like I was reading on the blogs and in so many of these books was all imperative. It was command, go, do it. You know, a lot of these people say the gospel is an invitation into a way of life. Well, to me, that I mean, I, I break the Ten Commandment and the Sermon on the Mount before breakfast. I mean, so I need something more than just an invitation into a Jesus way of life. I need to know what Jesus did for me because I don't live the kind of life that I need. And so that, that's where I felt like the gospel was missing. It was a message about what we can do to make the world a better place for Jesus as opposed to what God has done in His Son for sinners. Does it make an assumption? So when you say uh, an invitation to a life like Jesus or transform the world or bring God's shalom, is it assuming that people who do that have 
a solid knowledge of Jesus Christ, have a solid knowledge of the work of the cross, but don't say it clearly? Yeah, that's some of it. I think that happens a lot of the time. You know, so yeah, yeah, okay, the cross, yep, resurrection, death, you know, sin. Yeah, we, we understand that, but that's offensive or that's just not very exciting. Or frankly, churches do ignore the implications of the gospel. So it's not to say that there's nothing helpful in the emphasis, but so often it's not only ignored, but it's outright, you know, alienated or marginalized and say we don't want to deal with this sin management kind of problem or uh, one of the authors says in one place that the stuff of our evangelistic tracks, God's grace and the free offer of salvation, is at best a footnote to the gospel. Now that just doesn't seem to square with you know, what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he delivered as of first importance and then he defines the gospel as Jesus died for our sins and he rose again on the third day. So that, that doesn't seem to be the footnote. That, that's that's the, central. That's mm -hmm. central. That's of first importance, and it seems to be assumed at best in so much of the emergent literature. Okay, so we talk a little bit about the emergent literature, which is trying to describe the emergent church. And in your book you say, wow, this is amorphous. It's hard mm -hmm. to get your hands around. Mm -hmm. But how, how can we at least give a definition of what would it look like to be in an emergent church? I think that's the, the toughest question, and even after reading all this emergent literature, I don't know that we can answer it in a great way, but you know, sort of the, the elevator definition that we give of the emergent church is changing Christianity to accommodate a postmodern culture. Okay, changing Christianity, this gospel message, to accommodate a postmodern culture. Which is not terribly helpful because what is postmodernism mean? And, you know, I think it means different things to, to different people, and that's part of the definition of it. But, you know, to us, it's, you know, there's an aesthetic piece, so there's sort of the... What it looks like? Yeah, what it looks like, what it feels like. You know, postmodernism can be a, a, a mood or a feel, you know, sort of the... When we first started reading emergent literature, I think we thought it was the three C's, coffee, candles, and couches, you know, so we're going to try to make church cool again or whatever, which evangelicals are, are so guilty of doing. I mean, we chase trends almost to the point of being sad. There has been a drifting away by a postmodern uh, group of individuals, people mm -hmm. who really have trouble with the absolutes or mm -hmm. the absolute rock certainty or what even could look like a lack of humility on some mm -hmm. people's part. So that has pushed people away. Like, you know, Christianity had all the answers. Right. I don't mm -hmm. believe it has all the answers because I have doubts and it doesn't always make sense to me. So isn't there something positive about reimagining what church and Christianity can look like in order to reintroduce a very important aspect of social and civic life mm. and spiritual life to people who have brushed it aside? I think there is a positive, and I think, you know, hopefully one thing we did in the book was give credit where credit was due to the emergent church, and I think, you know, anytime you critique your institution, it, it can be a good thing, and we do have to look at those things, but, and I think there's a, a loving, God-affirming and God-pleasing way to present boundaries and doctrine, and, um, you know, we haven't been very good at that at times, you know, we haven't been very good at saying, I'm sorry, or, you know, we haven't always loved as we should, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think the answer to that is to, to have a boundaryless faith, and, you know, hopefully our book strikes somewhere in the middle. Yeah, and, and I would say so much of it depends on your context, and Ted and I grew up in the church in the Midwest, and, you know, we didn't go to perfect churches by any means, none of those exist, but we didn't go to some of these just terrible, terrible yeah. oppressive, seemingly churches. A stereotype, maybe. Yeah, a, a stereotype. stereotype. I mean, it may just be a perception, but, you know, the sort of church where, you know, they're measuring the, the length, length of, of your, your hair, hair or your right. skirt or something, or they wouldn't let us in until we shave our, you know, not very manly looking facial hair or whatever. <laughs> I mean, we, we weren't a part of those kind of churches. So I think a lot of the emergent church, it is reacting against that kind of uh, oppressive, even if it's more of a perception than reality, kind of church. They're also reacting against mega church, even though some of these churches are big, but a mm -hmm. kind of mega church, seeker sensitive, what was really hot in the 80s and 90s. And you said, you know, we want our churches to look like office spaces and we're not going to put crosses in and we're going to give 10 tips on how to handle your dog's stress or whatever. You know, I'm exaggerating, but th they looked at those churches and they said, come on, this isn't real. This isn't authentic. This doesn't deal with my pain and my struggles and my doubt. So uh, I agree. I think both of us agree often with their their diagnoses of some of the problems 
we just have a lot of issues with their cures. Mm -hmm. And they, they tend to be, in my opinion, in balance with what the whole of Scripture is teaching. Just to give one quick example, you know, we, we talk in the book about the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And there Jesus gives letters to real churches. And, you know, for example, one of the churches he is critical of because they've lost their first love. And they're all doctrinal and they're ethical, but they don't love people. They don't engage the culture. The emergent church sees that's the problem. And it is a problem somewhere. But what I think they're blind to is there are six other letters there to churches that over-identify with the culture that are too tolerant with doctrine. In fact, Jesus in those letters, he commends the churches for being intolerant of error and hating false teaching. Now, those are things not popular, not going to hear in emergent churches that Jesus is intolerant and he hates falsehood. But, but that's part of the whole biblical message that we need to be faithful to. Another distinction we wanted to make was that we don't want to be the emergent church police and, oh man, if you've lit a candle in your church, then, you know, bells and whistles are going off and, you know, it's a big controversy. I, I think, you know, there are some great examples of emerging Christians, Christians who do church with some of the, the vestiges of emergent. You know, they may change the aesthetic a little bit, but the, the gospel and orthodoxy remains the same. And I, I, we absolutely have no issue with that. So when there are these differences and deciding which ones are truly worth arguing about, what principles guide that discussion, that argument? You know, that was the, the hardest thing for me probably about this book was being someone who hates conflict and controversy. It was really tough for me to, to get to a place where I was ready to write a book that challenged other Christians. And I think, you know, it was something we wanted to do respectfully. We decided that the best way to do that would be to sort of reckon with what these guys had written and published. You know, it was so hard with the emergent church. I mean, you, you listen to talks or go to a service and, you know, guys will sort of contradict themselves or say that they were saying something just to be winsome or, you know, they, they were just trying to incite a reaction or whatever. So I, we really felt like the best way to, to deal with this was through the printed works that these guys had done. So really calling them uh, to account mm -hmm. for things that were already in print? Right, and, and that's part of their invitation was this is a conversation, and so we wanted to jump into the conversation and maybe a voice that hasn't been heard so much. And I think we, we tried to have in our minds, these guys were in front of us. W would we say this? Would we say it in this way? And, you know, they're good writers. They're playful. They're provocative. We tried to do those same things to make it accessible and, and fun to read. But we, we hopefully did it in a way that respected these guys and you know in a way that if we saw them we wouldn't be embarrassed to sit down and chat about these things okay but if I'm a person who's drifted away from Christianity mm -hmm. I am actually sort of enticed by this alternative mm -hmm. casual um, it looks very inviting it looks like the barriers of pews and rigidity and you kind of got to know the system when you go mm -hmm. into a church like how why do they stand up why do they sit down I don't know that there's something appealing about that but how do I tell if it's not enough? What should I be looking for so that I can say, hey, this is uh, gospel light? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the questions that I think you want to ask, either just in your own mind or of the people there or the pastor, number one, what is the view of the scriptures? I mean, everyone who says they're a Christian is going to say they like the Bible. Right. But in a lot of these books, the Bible is called an honored conversation partner, or it sort of helps us on the journey. So is there a view of scripture that this is a thus saith the Lord kind of document or... You, you use the phrase inerrant. Inerrant. What does, does that mean? Uh, what we mean by that is it doesn't have mistakes. Now, in, to the English translation, there's going to be differences, but it means when Paul wrote down the letters or Luke or Moses wrote down the books of the Bible that there were no errors. That was inspired by God. So this is fully trustworthy. This is the one place we can go for certain that we know God is speaking to us. This is where he's revealed himself to us. So, so it's truth. The it's Bible truth. is truth. It's truth. It's, it's know, not just a conversation. No, it's true truth, to use you know, the, the old phrase. And it's not just a journey. And I understand that metaphor. Life is hard. You're on a journey. But it's also a destination. We are going somewhere. We want to land in a place. And that gets to be you know, some of the difficulty with Okay, doubt. You know, Jude, the book of the Bible, Jude, says, have mercy on those who doubt. So it's not the unforgivable sin. We need to have space for questioning. But it, it's not the goal either. I mean, the disciples were rebuked for having little faith. 
I mean, when Peter sunk in the water, Jesus didn't say, oh, I love your doubts. I'm just so happy for these paradoxes. I mean, he But it's, it's this, it's this uh, balancing act because people who are coming back into the church or who have had negative experiences or have seen the hypocrisy of the church, they're kind of doubting whether this is something they want to buy into again. Mm. And yet um, we can grab hold of some things that are very certain. We know where we're going, like you say. Well, how do you create a space where doubt can have real um, respect? Mm. And so you don't say, well, if you doubt here, keep it under wraps. You don't want that. But you're saying that people linger too long in doubt. Yeah, and, and I think it has to do, do you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, and so I preach. And I believe there should be a time in our church for conversation, for dialogue, for facilitation. But the word for a preacher in the New Testament is herald. So I'm going to stand up and I'm going to give a message as from the king and say, hear ye, hear ye, here's a word from King Jesus. Now, hopefully I can do it in a way that's sensitive that not everyone here is already agreeing with me. And so you need to be wise about that and understand there are people who are struggling with these questions. But I, I think so much of what happens is doubt. You want to put all that into the worship service rather than, you know, have that in the life of your church. And, you know, the other questions that you need to ask besides scripture and, you know, do you really believe things, but what is the gospel? What, what did the cross accomplish? You know, I think if we say these things and we do it in a way that's humble, see often humility is e equated with uncertainty. Correct. And there's this famous quote from G.K. Chesterton that we've put humility in the wrong place. We put it over the organ of knowledge instead of ambition. And so he says, and this was 75 years ago, we're in danger of making a race of men too meager to believe in the multiplication tables. And, and I actually think that it's, it's hard to say what all of you know, the young people or Generation Y or whatever are into or what's going to appeal to you know, burned out church folks. Certainly, mm -hmm. you know, the clip we saw, that, that may be it for some people, but you, know, you see studies that they like old architecture. They like pews. They even like organs. Well, God says uh, in, in Scripture, um, t uh, Jesus, take up my cross and follow me. Mm. And that may mean that you have to deny yourself some things. Does the emergent church talk about how your life will be countercultural? Uh, to be fair, I think they do. Um, but it's, a, it's different. Um, and it's probably a needed you know, emphasis in some ways. You know, they would definitely talk about countercultural in terms of social justice and maybe identifying with the poor and they're, they're very strong on social issues and, you know, rejecting a consumer it's a very, culture. It's a very culturally popular counterculture, right. if that makes any sense. Explain that a little bit. Well, I mean, I, I think it's the sort of counterculture that's popular. You know, I think Madison Avenue uses rebellion to sell you your cup of coffee and your Mac and, you know, whatever else they're, they're selling. And I think that rebellion ethic, that sort of anti-authoritarian bent is is popular and I think a lot of the things that even the good things that the emergent church affirms the things that Kevin mentioned you know those are you know in a sense counterculture but in a sense they're not because they're they're what the culture is affirming them. so there's well, no risk inherent in that well so environmentalism for instance creation mm -hmm. care taking care of the world that God has given us that's mm -hmm. something that really uh, Christians can ad adapt across the board, sure. and uh, pover you know, working f to alleviate poverty and justice issues. All of those things are things we would all agree with. Mm -hmm. Is it that they don't go far enough then? They stay with things that, sure, we can all accept mm -hmm. that? I, I think so. Y yeah, I mean, it's, it's not having those bubble out of the gospel. I mean, out of what Christ has done for me and it's often sidestepping the offensive parts. Because if you give that message, you know, if, if I tell people at Michigan State University, non-Christians, here's what being a Christian means. It means you fight against human trafficking and AIDS and global warming, and you try to love your neighbor and be tolerant. Now, there's some true things there, but, I mean, that's going to sell. That's going to sell at the Oscars mm -hmm. and Oprah because you don't have the scandal of the cross. And so that's what I feel like is missing and maybe it's just assumed and maybe it shows up in other sermons but certainly in what a lot of these guys are are writing about and blogging about that really gets minimized and I think that's the real heart of our message. Okay so the scandal of the cross because we would all agree that if you could get 
Christians and non-Christians involved in those topics you just mentioned, it would be a good thing. Sure. Why does the scandal of the cross, what is it, and why does it have to be added to it? I think the cross is scandalous because it suggests need on my part. It suggests that I'm sinful, I'm broken, I'm less than whole. Hmm. And that's a message that is very unpopular. And you talk about countercultural, I mean, that's countercultural, you know. I mean, everything I need is not right here. Everything I need is not right here. And in fact, I'm, I'm sinful. You know, I'm, I'm in need of a redeemer. I'm in need of a savior. And I think, you know, there, there's so many books published in the, the Christian world now. And, you know, our time is of, there's such a premium on our time. And I, I just felt like, man, if I'm going to read books and listen to sermons and, and worship once a week or more, I, I want it to be about the gospel. You know, I want it to be about this cross and this redeemer that we, we say we love and we follow. And, you know, I, I just didn't see a whole lot of that in the emergent literature. Let me ask this. Does does the motivation, so if you're, if you're being motivated on AIDS and, and uh, stopping of the human trafficking mm-hmm. and uh, stopping oppression because you are living out in gratitude for what God has done for you, or if you just think those, those are good ideas, does mm-hmm. it matter? Yeah, I mean, it matters. And we want to be clear that you, know, you can have Christians in all sorts of walks of life, politics, culture, academia, who are concerned about those. And I'm not saying every time you give somebody you know, a, a cup of cold water, you have to also give them a gospel tract, although there are worse ideas. But what I'm saying is the message that comes from the church and comes from the pulpit ought to be Christ and Him crucified. And yes, there are going to be these social ramifications, but so often the message of Christ and Him crucified for our sins as a substitute of violent death to appease God's just wrath, that is offensive, and it's not only offensive to those who don't know Christ, I understand that, Uh, we can still respect one another, but it seems to be uh, an embarrassing truth to many people in our churches, and and that's what I want to be front and center, and you're going to have the other stuff too, and that's good. I mean, it's good to be going out, and what are the implications, and we want to make a difference, but we need to keep the main things the main things and not sidestep them. Now, there are a certain number of leaders of the emergent church movement. They would probably not like to be called leaders mm-hmm. of the emergent church movement. Why is that? Well, I think, you know, they, they've never been big fans of boundaries or, or definitions or boxing themselves in. Tony Jones, one of the, the leaders of the emergent movement, he's the, the chair of Emergent Village, um, said our only statement of faith is that we have no statements of faith. So, you know, you'll get guys who sort of try to distance themselves from emergent or guys that embrace the, the label. You know, I think that like with any people group, it is very um, hard not to stereotype, mm-hmm. you know, uh, certain groups because you have to talk about things collectively because, you know, there's a stereotype that some evangelicals only are re- interested in the relationship between me and God. Right. Mm-hmm. If I got that right, then I don't have to worry mm-hmm. about really the horizontal, exactly. you know, me and my neighbor. Mm-hmm. And there is probably some appropriate criticism that there was a whole lot about, well, if I'm right with God, um, I can go about and sort of do my own thing. Mm-hmm. So the emergent church is really a reaction to some mm-hmm. of the negatives that people have really experienced mm-hmm. in the church. Yeah. Do you think that the missing pieces are salvation issues? You know, that's a weighty question. Um, I, I don't think it's my place to presume on what these leaders and their relationship with God. I think you see an example in Scripture that the writers of the New Testament are, are giving the benefit of the doubt to people who call themselves Christians. So I'm going to call these guys brothers, sisters in the Lord. But I, I think the message that they're often giving can be a salvation issue because the means by which we are saved is taken out of it. You're absolutely right that we need to see our relationship with God as also having horizontal implications. But if I don't see that the main problem in the world is human rebellion against God, and my main problem is that left to myself, I am not right with my Creator. If you leave that out or you just assume it or it gets buried in a footnote or in a statement of faith that no one really talks about, then I think these are salvation issues and people are not helped. As as much as we might be thankful for good things that get done, 
If that piece is missing, then I don't think the church is being faithful as the church. I think that one of the theological tenets is that we cannot earn our salvation. We cannot just do a bunch of really good things mm -hmm. and be right with God because it's God's actions towards us that make us right with God. Mm. I think the, it's how do you get in the door? You know, and so once you're in the door, maybe attracted by a horizontal relationship with my neighbor, doing good things for the world, being culturally engaged, I think in your book you're saying you better have more. And if you're attending one of those churches, look for more. And press. Yeah, I think all the emergent people say, test it. Yeah, question, mm -hmm. probe, question. all that. All that. And so yeah. don't uh, feel uncomfortable maybe creating a little conflict. Mm -hmm. Like where is this motivation coming from uh, for doing good things? Right. Well, um, thank you very much for being with us today. My guests today have been Pastor Kevin DeYoung and writer Ted Cluck, co-authors of the book, Why We're Not Emergent, by two guys who should be. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass.